In the near future, I'm going to make some much longer discussion videos looking into more details on certain parts of ARP's data and different ways we can interpret this. But before we do, I would like to create a short video that summarizes the main points from the last five videos. Let's run through my takeaways from ARP's evidence. Number one, the location of quasars. We clearly see many examples of quasar pairs situated across an axis of a nearby galaxy. Often we find multiple strands of quasars running along these lines, and these lines can run perpendicular to each other, centered around the host galaxy, often creating what we see as an X shape. Number two, redshift data shows ejection velocities. When you examine the redshift of these pairs, they come at very specific values. In other words, they are quantized. When we examine these pairs across a galaxy, there is often a small deviation between one side and the other side. And this difference accounts for an ejection velocity, meaning one is ejected towards us and one away. Number three, Redshift along the line from the central galaxy starts high and decreases as you move further outwards. And this tends to indicate that as the quasars move further out, something is affecting their redshift in clear jumps. This may in turn be related to how the quasar is evolving into a galaxy. Number four, we see ejection of both material and quasars along these lines. In particular, we see both blobs of material ejected which have either X-ray or radio sources in them. We see clear jets from the galactic core ejecting out along these lines. And we even have some examples of quasars that sit very close to the galaxy nucleus, in the case of the Einstein cross images. Number five, when you examine a comparison of the Tully-Fisher measurement with redshift distance, for some of the active Seyfert galaxies, we see that there is a large discrepancy with the highest redshift galaxies. And this, for me, is one of the key pieces of evidence that shows that redshift is not an accurate measure of distance. Number six, when we examine the Virgo cluster and Centaurus A, we see the picture of ejection along a line and that these quasars and ejected material eventually form into galaxies further down the line, and that as you move further out, that these galaxies seem to get larger, more evolved. Number seven, when you examine the Virgo cluster, we also see that there is a very strong association with bright quasars and nearby galaxies. And sometimes these are so close that you would expect to find a gravitational distortion, i.e. a lensing effect, yet none have ever been seen. Again, once more proving the fact that these quasars are not massively distant, but actually sit very close to the galaxy. Number eight, successive generations of galaxies. We see material being ejected along a line, and we see this material evolving over time. So in the case of M49, we see that further along this line, we get M87, which is in itself a highly active galaxy. And this galaxy itself then initiates its own process and starts ejecting material on a different line to that that created it, which in turn seeds more quasars and creates its own galaxies. Number nine, the Virgo cluster seems to be a very active region where new galaxies and quasars are being formed. It is likely that Centaurus A was created out of this, and this may also hold for Andromeda and our own Milky Way. Number 10, the Virgo cluster seems to be more active in the northern region compared to the southern region. Number 11, both galaxies and quasars show a quantization of the redshift in steps of 72 kilometers per second and 37 and a half kilometers per second. Number 12, ARP also saw that there was an offset for this quantization which was related to distance. And that's important because when you look at the whole catalog, you don't see that clear quantization because it smears out because of the distance. Now, the big question here, obviously, is how do we measure that distance? And in the case when Art was looking at it, he compared the local cluster to the Virgo cluster. 
But in some of his other work, he also indicates that we could use apparent magnitude to start identifying that distance. So again, that's something that, that needs further investigation in my mind to, to see whether we can get a clearer picture of how that offset would work and what that offset might actually mean. Number 13, examination of both the X-ray and the gamma ray emissions from the main quasars in the Virgo cluster reveals that there is a large structure that seems to connect them together and in fact, some of the highest gamma ray energy comes not as a point source from these objects, but instead from a very diffuse area surrounding them. Number 14. Cosmic ray emissions seem to all point to an origin from within the Virgo cluster. And again, this relates back to the point that the Virgo cluster seems to be an incredibly active area. Number 15. This quantization shows that redshift does not equate to distance, as otherwise we would sit at the centre of a series of walls of material that are expanding outwards at different speeds. Number 16. The material that is ejected from active galaxies tends to form expanding shells which can look like arcs. Gravitational lensed images that show arcs may in fact be this material which is then ejected and would have a higher redshift making them appear as if they are distant objects only because of their redshift. Number 17, Einstein cross images may actually be the ejection process of active objects out of the galaxy along both axes. We see examples of this in other galaxy images where there is a clear symmetry within the galaxy of this ejected material, but in those cases the ejected material are radio or X-ray sources. Number 18. These images also show that we need to consider this ejection process as acting along the spiral arms, and in some examples of galaxies these arms extend over vast distances and show clear clumping of material. Number 19. Peculiar galaxies. And this sort of goes with the previous point. There is much more that we can learn from the examples of ARP's vast catalogue of peculiar galaxies for clues as to the mechanism that govern galaxy birth and evolution. And number 20, do the peculiar jets out of galaxies play a crucial role in understanding this ejection process? And again, this comes back to the point that when we examine some of these galaxies and we examine the jets and how some of these jets end at right angles, to me suggests there are some boundary condition that they are interacting with. And again, this may hold a clue to understanding how these processes actually work. Now these for me are the standout pieces of evidence. Let me know which you feel are the most important and if there are any that I've missed out. I would also like to take a moment to thank all of my Patreon supporters. If you are interested in becoming a member, please see the link down below in the description. In the next part, we will be talking in depth with Jim Weninger to tackle the subject of the quantization of redshift. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.